Hello everyone and thanks for tuning in for this Paranormal Pit Stop. Tonight, we'll be exploring a popular science museum located off South Disable Lakeshore Drive within Jackson Park in the Hyde neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois, right between Lake Michigan and the University of Chicago. Recognized as one of the largest science museums in the world at over 400,000 square feet of exhibits and rumored to harbor a range of ghostly activity, are you prepared to brave the history and hauntings of the Museum of Science and Industry? Historically, the Palace of Fine Arts at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, also recognized as the Fine Arts Building, was designed under Charles B. Atwood for one D.H. Burnham and Company, and would be utilized to display paintings, prints, drawings, sculptures, and metalworks from across the globe. Following the World's Fair, the site would house the Columbian Museum, which would eventually be re-established as the Field Museum of Natural History. And when this venue was transferred to a newer building down in 1920, the aged former fine arts building would be left vacant. In the years following, Art Institution of Chicago Professor Lerato Taft would campaign for the building's restoration and transformation into a dedicated sculpture museum, and the South Park Commission, which was an early precursor to the Chicago Park District, would gain approval for the project, under the caveat the museum also accommodate a tech trade school and several other features. Ultimately, however, the site would eventually be selected to host a new science museum instead. Around the same time, the Commercial Club of Chicago would express interest in launching a science museum in the city, and following a financial rallying of his fellow club members, legendary philanthropist and president of Sears, Roebuck & Company, Julius Rosenwald, would amass and pledge $3 million into the transformation of the Palace of Fine Arts. Rosenwald would establish the museum's organization in 1926, and though he'd declined to have his name on the building, many would begin referring to the site as the Rosenwald Industrial Museum until 1928 when the establishment's title was officiated as the Museum of Science and Industry. The Museum of Science and Industry would see three separate opening phases, the first being in 1928, the second through a ceremony at the 1933 Century of Progress Exposition, and a third and complete grand opening in 1940. As the museum grew in popularity, in 1983, construction would be started on an underground parking structure beneath its front lawn to better accommodate the rising masses, though this space wouldn't be considered officially completed until the 1990s. Also through the 90s, the MSI would begin charging an entrance fee for the first time, after remaining free for over half a century with the exception of small charges under the coal mine and U-505 exhibits, though even to date, the organization actually may maintains a number of free days for locals and state residents. Most recently, on October 3rd of 2019, the Museum of Science and Industry would announce its intention to change its name to the Kenneth C. Griffin Museum of Science and Industry, following a donation of $125 million under the Chicago billionaire himself, which actually marked the largest single gift in the museum's history and literally doubled its worth. The Museum of Science and Industry remains open into the present, offering over 2,000 exhibits across 75 major halls, some of which include permanent installations, traveling collections, and more. Through the length of its existence, the MSI has been shrouded in a range of ghost stories and local legends, with both staff and visitors to its bounds reporting extreme cold spots, doors that open and close inexplicably, and lights that flicker or burn out spontaneously, even when fresh bulbs are installed. Herman Webster Mudgett, also recognized as Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, or H.H. Holmes, was a notorious American con artist and serial killer who was executed in 1896. Chillingly, right near yesterday's Main Street, which is a dark recreation of a 19th century route, a phantom matching Holmes' description, clad in a bowler hat and with a mustache, has been encountered and has been known to give off menacing glares before disappearing. Preceding his death in 1938, the ashes of Clarence Darrow, the famed lawyer who defended notorious murderers Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold, were scattered within the Jackson Park Lagoon, and following, passerbys would begin sighting his spectral form on the back steps of the museum, as well as wandering about inside after close. The Pioneer Zephyr, which is a diesel train that was constructed in 1934 under the Bud Company for the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad on what was commonly referred to as the Burlington Route, was the second 
internal combustion-powered streamliner intended for mainline service in the whole of the U.S., the first of its class powered by diesel, the first to enter revenue service, and would operate faithfully until 1960, when it was retired and donated to the museum. Those working aboard and touring the Zephyr have told of disembodied conversations and laughter, of old-timey music that emanates from thin air, and of the sensation of being brushed up against by invisible shoulders. Reported throughout the whole of the Museum of Science and Industry, and confined to no area in particular, are orbs and half-formed silhouettes captured in photography, alarms that sound without cause, and the feelings of being watched, followed, or of being touched by something unseen. Lastly, the MSI's collection boasts an authentic German U-boat, the U-505, which wreaked havoc over the seas until 1944, when it was captured by Allied forces, who took its crew prisoner. The museum would acquire the sub in 1954, after which those who braved it begin reporting a host of inexplicable happenings. A closer investigation would reveal a dark history, telling of how, in 1943, the U-505 had been attacked with depth charges courtesy of an Allied destroyer, resulting in its commander, one Peter Zajcek, shooting himself in the head when he believed all was lost. Disturbingly, it's told that this shot didn't actually kill the commander, and that as he lay dying on the ground, crying out and gurgling, his crew members actually rushed to his sides and muffled his face with a pillow to prevent detection, while simultaneously assisting in his departure from this world. To date, several security guards have reported disembodied voices across the sub, encounters with what's believed to be the spirit of Zajcek himself, often sporting a nasty head wound, and strange sightings of detached shoes feet, or legs through the doors of the commander's chamber. Thanks for joining us on this Paranormal Pit Stop. If you enjoyed our histories and ghost stories, subscribe to our channel, like this upload, and share us with anyone you feel deserves a good scare. We'll see you next time.